Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another week and uh, a couple days late. I know you were under the weather, but uh, as this drops, it is Thanksgiving morning. I hope everyone is doing well. How are you, my friend? Um, I'm doing much better. Um, and this week's episode is brought to you by the letters W A S N P. <laughs> um, it, it definitely is. And this was a selfish, selfish choice on my part, having seen them in concert last Friday. Um, but so I look forward to talking about that. But before we get to some Wasp, how about uh, some new stuff this week? Uh, the new Marius Danielson single leaked. I was really, really, um, surprised that he was now doing something kind of under his own name and not under that Legend of Valley Doom moniker. Um, I posted it on our social media pages just because I, I you know, I, I thought that it was definitely worthy of a listen. Seems to be getting some good reviews, so uh, more power to him. Yeah, I was um, I was kind of uh, tickled to see that um, Carl Ken James of Shadow Gallery enjoyed it i don't know if you saw that but he actually made a comment saying how that he really liked it and yeah yeah i tagged marius i happened to be friends with him on facebook so he could see it so i i thought it might have been a thrill for him to see somebody like carl uh appreciate his work i always find it funny that carl can be kind of a power metal guy despite being one of the the driving forces behind uh, an all-time great uh prog metal band yeah, very, very well said. I, th- I found that interesting as well. Um, just a couple of other things on my end. The new Candlemas album came out, and um, it was interesting. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to hear any of the stuff off of this album or or what have you, but I, I gave it a good listen. And I, I got to be honest, it was it was different. It's called Sweet Evil Sun, and it has that classic Candlemas sound, but it also has like a lot of hard rock to it. So it's kind of like they're I don't want to say going mainstream, but kind of trying to keep their core sound, but appealing to a broader audience. Really interesting listen. I don't know that it's going to be my album of the year, but um, definitely worthy of, of 45 minutes or so. Is Matt Levin still their vocalist? No, it's uh, they're back to, um, what you would call it, back to uh, Johan Lankvist, the, uh, the the singer from Epicus, Dumicus, Metallicus that we oh. covered. Yeah, everything seems to come full circle. He's been with the band, I guess, probably since twenty. 20- 18 2019 or so and when i saw them on seventy thousand tons i actually got to see them with the original singer which was pretty freaking cool i gotta say it was he, he his voice sounds good he, he doesn't have a lot of miles on it so it's it, it held up well even though it's been 40 years since the debut or whatever 30 almost 40 years nice uh, i'd be curious to hear that it being that that one album is pretty much my only knowledge of the band so well, you get to kind of bookend it, right? You'll list, you, you'll have listened to the first album, you'll listen to the new album, and then see if you kind of get the stuff in the middle or, or, or what have you. Yeah. Uh, well, if, one- if, if the if the new album's good and I like the old album, then maybe I'll just skip everything in between and call it a day. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, and then kind of a bit of news, Enslaved has announced their new studio album, Heimdall. Uh, it's coming out March 3rd of next year, and they dropped the single for their song, Congelia. Uh, if you like Enslaved, you're going to like this. And and somebody actually said that they describe Enslaved to someone who's never heard them as black metal meets Pink Floyd. And I like the description, so I thought it was I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, but they're they're a band that I like. Always listen to their new album, and I always like it. And then I kind of drift away, and I'll listen to something a little more tame, and then I'll go back to it and stuff like that. I, I think they're a great band, so I'm gonna I'll post that track. Uh, possibly over the weekend or something like that, because our new our new or our next episode will drop on Monday, which will be here before you know it. Yeah, um, maybe it'll create a new genre. We can call it um, Wishicus, Uicus, we're Hericus. So. <laughs> there you go. I like it. Um, anything on your end? Did you did you hear anything that was worthy? Yeah, I actually did. Um, I a uh, couple of things. Um, first off. Um, uh wow what was i gonna say oh um ad infinitum a band that we bring up ad infinitum um (laughs) released a new single from their uh chapter three downfall album which uh is not going to make it out by the end of this year so will not won't be uh, on either of our lists uh same for um beyond the black for that matter i believe both of those albums are coming out in january um, but a uh, new single called Somewhere Better, um, again, just uh, really kind of par for the course for them, but that's uh, always a good thing. Um, 
And uh, yeah, and I, 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 I promised uh, a week and a half ago when we talked that I was going to listen to that Epica EP, and I finally did. And boy, I enjoyed it a lot. But um, one of the songs that really um, that really uh, stuck out to me was uh, Sirens of Blood and Water because it featured uh, Charlotte Wessels, who um, I, I'm always just happy to hear her voice. It, it's like um, just comforting uh, to, to hear her, especially now that um, you know, she's not in Delane anymore. Um, I, I have a feeling we're going to find more things like this where she kind of pops up a, as a guest here and there. Um, and then other than that, um, I really have just been trying to focus on, uh, shoring up my end of the year list, um, which is, uh, man, I, was, I had mentioned to you that like, there's stuff that, According to iTunes, I listened to it, but I, according to my aging brain, I, I don't really remember. So uh, I'm kind of revisiting some stuff. Um, even albums I kind of do remember, I listened to them so earlier in the year that I just don't really remember them all that well. And, and I'll be honest that amazing? with you, like, yeah, I, I, there wasn't that much stuff that really made me want to revisit it this year. And so that, yeah. and, and I know we're going to really get deep into the weeds when it comes to that uh when we do our our episode but yeah like it's there's just been a lot of a lot of very good stuff but not a lot of really great like you know blow blow your socks off kind of stuff that has at least for me has been few and far between um i agree i agree and it's a little disappointing in that regard um i'm sure many would argue that it's been a great year and that there's been a ton of memorable stuff i wouldn't um Good stuff, for sure. Lots of good stuff. Not a lot of great stuff. But, yeah. listen, there's still the time, lot. And by the time part. this episode drops, um, actually, no, uh, if this episode is dropping Thursday, um, the, the following day, uh, Glenn from Prog Power is going to release his, his annual list, which I think a lot of people always look forward to. And I always end up finding bands that I'd never even heard of in, like, his top five. <laughs> so, uh you know, I, I remember last year him. Uh, he he had a lot of good things to say about orbit culture, and then next thing you know, they're on the bill for Prog Power next year. And and uh, I know uh, a lot of people are excited about that. So um, sometimes his list could be a little bit of a tell too of who he might be thinking about uh, booking the following year. Um, I, I never have any idea what it, he's thinking, to be honest with you. But uh, um, I always look forward to seeing it because. Um, it's just, it's usually like a, a half, half of it is like albums I listen to and half of it is sh- the shit I've never even heard of. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it keeps it interesting. It's definitely um, all over the map to say the least. I'm curious to see if the Evergrays is number one again. I, I, I liked it. I really did. Uh, it'll be on my list. I think I don't, I, know that I would it. venture to say it might even be on my list this year. It's probably my favorite Evergrey album, at least in a long time for me. I really liked it. I, I'm, that's, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm a little surprised, but uh, I'm curious to see how high it winds up on your list. Yeah. They, 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 like... they, they, ch- they chipped away at me after all these years. Well, I guess it's like the, the guy that asks the girl out a thousand times and then the thousand and one time she's so sick of it that eventually she just acquiesces. <laughs> it, that's, that, that was your love affair with Evergrey. So, you know. Am, they, I, they am, kept, I, the, am I the guy or the girl in this scenario? <laughs> no, you're the girl. You're oh, the girl. Okay. And they, they kept asking and kept asking and you kept rejecting the overtures. And <laughs> eventually, uh, I guess no, uh, no meant yes. I, I, I don't know. But we, 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 you come around. So that's I'm glad to hear it. Uh, well, I guess I was in search of truth, and I found yeah. it. <laughs> um, let's talk about some wasps, shall we? I, uh, I I will definitely talk a little bit about the show that I saw, which was really really interesting uh, in and of itself. And I have yeah, some strong I, I, thoughts. I actually heard I heard I've been hearing some stuff, and so I I'm I'm, I'm going to let you kind of talk about it, and then I'm going to follow up with some of the. I, I was surprised at, at some of of the the talk that I've been seeing and. I'm not gonna I that. haven't seen any talk, so I'm curious okay. to see if my – and I haven't even talked about this with anyone. So I'm curious if my impressions of the show matched or mirrored what other people are saying or if I am on an island all by myself, which is so often the case. Um, I have a feeling that what you're going to say is similar to what I've been reading, but uh, I'll let you – Okay. I'll let you talk about it. 
All right, we'll, we'll get there. I want to talk about their debut album. I want to go back to August 17th of 1984. I wasn't two at this point, so needless to say, I didn't hear this album for the first time uh, when it came out, uh, and obviously you didn't either. This is their debut album, and what's interesting is I had you listen to the reissue, which came out, I think, in 1998, if I'm not mistaken, and I did that on purpose because there are a couple of songs, both in terms of the bonus tracks on the back end and the first track that's on this pressing, which are like seminal Wasp tracks, so I thought it was important to listen to that Although, obviously, the main focus of this will be on the 10 um, classic original pressing songs, if you will. I'm curious as to someone who's like kind of not never really heard this band, what your thoughts were. Because for me, I remember seeing a music video for them in like the late 90s. And I went to Tower Records and I bought their best of. And for a while, that was only the only material I had from this band, which like the 15 songs or so that were on this best of. But I played the hell out of it. And I really, really became like a closet fan of these guys. But I never took the time to explore the back catalog. I just knew the greatest hits. So even for me, this was a bit of an experience because I wasn't familiar with um, probably about half of these songs. Uh, I wasn't familiar with any of them. So um, this was really a... a your opening experience to, to say the least. Um, I, I, I listened to it as, as if it was like the original 10 track pressing. And then, and then I would listen to the additional songs after, because I kind of wanted to get a vibe of what the album sounded like, just what it felt like at the time. Um, and then, but I, I definitely listened to all the extra tracks uh, just as much as the rest of the album, just not in that, it, or the Sequence. same order as the reissue, uh, where Animal is the first track. And um, it's interesting, I, I found this out through just uh, going onto Wikipedia, that um, they wanted to use this song on the album. And the, um, I don't know if it was the label or, or um, I, I, I guess, yeah, I guess it was, uh, yeah, Capitol Records um, had the song pulled uh, because it, uh, the song is literally called animal uh fuck fuck like a beast which <laughs> sounds like it might have been a steel panther song like you know just 20 years before yeah. um but yep. uh yeah so it, it, they ended up releasing it as a single in the UK instead and then it looks like um when we got a little less sensitive in 1998 we decided that it was okay to be, be put a uh, to put that on as the first track on the reissue um i guess it's kind of like almost like uh rewriting history in a way where it's like they wanted this song on the album and and sure enough you know they 14 years later they were going to make it happen so it's it's funny to me though because I, I think the steel panther comparison is so apt they were doing it at least lyrically in many ways but so far ahead of their time but i don't think that the world was ready for it in 1984 and although you had bands like motley crew and, and other bands that kind of alluded to certain things at least with Wasp, they kind of just, they made it crystal clear what they were talking about. There was no illusion here. It was, <laughs> I mean, Blackie Lawless tells you how it is. So I guess to, to his credit, um, not leaving much to the imagination with this one. And I'll, I'll just kind of go through the band It's because it's pretty interesting. Blackie Lawless on lead guitars and bass, he would, lo he would later take over guitar duties uh, for the band. So it's interesting how he started out as their bass player and then moved to guitars. Um, Chris Holmes on lead and rhythm guitars. Randy Piper on lead and rhythm guitars. Tony Richards. On Rowdy drums. Randy Piper. I should have said that. And I <laughs> am, I acknowledge the missed opportunity and I, I, I or, throw myself. Or his, or his alternate name, Macho Man Randy Piper. That's, I, 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 th I think both are completely acceptable. Um, Chris Holmes was was interesting. I remember watching a um, – I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's really kind of worth seeing. But the um, – what's it called? Like the end of uh, end of Civilization Part 2 or something like that. It's this like metal documentary. Oh, was, it's um, Penelope Spheris I yes, think was the director. That's so right. That's, that's kind of that, – that was how she got the gig for Wayne's World was from her doing that movie. That's kind of where she got her uh, – or at least like – they had heard of her and they, you know, um, the, I guess, who, the, uh, I don't know if it was, um, you know, uh, Lauren Michaels from Saturday Night Live or whoever, uh, when they 
you know, had her direct the, the first Wayne's World movie. It was a lot to do with that, you know, that film. Great film. And I've watched it multiple times, but one of the most jarring recurring themes in that movie is watching Chris Holmes from Wasp literally deteriorate on camera. And he's just such a raging, raging alcoholic that it's really sad in, in a number of ways because I don't think he lived much past that film or, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I don't recall exactly when he passed, but like, um, it's, it's just really, really sad. He actually, now that I think about it, I guess it was 2000 and one, he passed away. Um, actually, you know what? I stand corrected. He is still, is he still alive? I, I am shocked. Wikipedia does not show him as deceased. So I thought he was, I thought he had passed away. If I'm wrong, it is a miracle because he was not in good shape back in the day. I, I thought he, I, I thought he had passed. Um, but I guess I was wrong. God, God uh, hopefully, bless. no. Hopefully, hopefully, yeah. nobody that's related to him was listening to this podcast. Hey, you know what? I, I stand corrected in my mind, and you're absolutely right. He is still alive, and apparently, he's actually commented on the film because he didn't like the way he was portrayed. There's a shocker. Um, but he he is he is alive. I don't know that he's well, but he's definitely alive. So rumors rumors of Chris Holmes's demise have been greatly exaggerated. Was, there you go. Um, but very good guitar player, but just um, no longer no longer with Wasp. Um, let's, let's kind of just get into it because this, this, this was, um, really a, an interesting album for the time because a lot of, this was kind of that, the beginning of the birth of that like eighties sunset strip era. I mean, it was obviously it had been going on for a while, but these guys fit right in with a lot of those bands. And for me, they kind of are just like the second coming of Motley Crue in a number of ways. And some of these tracks sound like they're right off of a Motley Crue record, um, what did you think of Animal? And I'll, I guess I'll start there, even though I know it's not actually the first track, but it is one of their most famous tunes, and they played it live the other night. Um, it was good. Like, it, it, I don't think it would have been out of place uh, if it was on the album originally. Um, just really catchy tune. Um, I'm kind of, I kind of like. Um, I want to be somebody better as as the opener. Um, it's interesting that they chose this to be the first track when they re-released it. Um, but, uh, I mean, I can understand the, the appeal and why they wanted to release it as a single. And, uh, I can understand why they were, uh, disappointed that the, um, the song was, was ended up being removed from the album. Um, good tune. Um, I, it's, uh, I, I have to say I'm, and I feel like I say this a lot of when we cover bands from around this time. It, it's surprising to me, like that. I don't know. It, it sounds like it, it. It sounds like it would be more modern than 1984 to me. Mm. I think that I, I thought like somebody had warned warned us about the production value, and I, I actually for an album that came out in 1984, unless the reissue was like remixed or remastered or something, it sounds pretty good to me. Um, I, 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 I've heard things from years later that sounded a lot worse than this. So, um, almost unlistenable product- in many cases. This, I, I, I thought the production here, there were certain songs that I thought the production was actually pretty bad, but this one, not one of those tracks. I thought that it, it has this raw, unpolished sleaziness to it, but I think that was on purpose. Like, I think that that's the sound they were going for and they did it really, really well. Um, and, and, this this song has a very big feel to it, like a very like uh, grandiose, you know, with catchy, catchy chorus. I love this song when I was a kid. I, I really did. I think I've played it this a little could, bit too couldn't much. Couldn't tell your parents that you love. No, this song, abso- no. absolutely not. <laughs> that was not going to happen. I think this had the parental warning on it actually. But um, <laughs> for me, I don't know that I love it as much as I used to. Whereas I want to be somebody. The second track or, or the first track, depending on how you look at it. This is probably their biggest song. This is what they closed their set with when I saw them last week. They, um, this is their hit. And this, I think, is the song that they're most known for because it's got this really awesome drum beginning. And then it goes right into this catchy, catchy riff. Um, another classic, classic tune. And Blackie's vocals on this track are just phenomenal. And I, and nobody's going to confuse him for Jeff Tate, right? Like that's just not the kind of sound he has, but for this kind of like sleazy, almost like a hardcore superstar type of uh, vibe to it, 
this is really, really um, special in terms of the way he approaches the vocals. He's a very good front man. And I, from what I understand, it was even crazier back in 1985. I had friends that saw him back in the day and like it was a wild, wild show. But this song, even live, has that anthemic, anthemic sing-along quality to it. It's definitely a favorite of mine. Cool. Um, I, I have to say, like, this being uh, my my first time really listening to, to his, his vocals for an entire album, um, I, I really enjoyed them. Um, I feel like you don't hear singers that sound like this anymore. Um, the closest that it reminded me of was... Um, the the uh, late vocalist from Quiet Riot um, Ke- was it uh, Kevin DeBrow? Is that his name? Um, he uh, he actually did pass away. Um, he, it kind of reminded me of the little bit that I was aware of by Quiet Riot. Um, but th- I felt like this th- the difference was was that this felt less um, it felt less like radio oriented, like they were trying to make pop hits or like pop rock hits like this is like the whole album really is very um very like just hard rock and and it do, it's not quite at that point where you know Motley Crue was obviously making songs like girls 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 because they knew that it was going to be you know a big hit on MTV and on the radio and stuff like this to me sounds like a band who couldn't give a shit if this stuff was on the radio <laughs> they just wanted to make make their album and make a good album and and uh and that's just how it comes across to me that doesn't feel like they were trying to uh manufactured for radio or exactly because yeah i also like i mean i don't i'm not like a an expert on the 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 scene at that time but i feel like it hadn't quite blown up to where it would be in like 86 87 at this point so um the 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 you know that west coast that west coast scene was kind of still kind of in its infancy to my understanding. Yeah, it was, it was. And I actually have a wonderful book that I read. It was called Hollywood rocks. And it's basically the ultimate guide to how the Hollywood, California music scene in the eighties. And it's all, um, interviews and basic, not interviews, but basically like excerpts from conversations with all the players uh, at the time it's a really easy, quick read. And I think I blew through it in like two days just because it was fascinating to me watching like the rise and fall. And they kind of talk about how like they started in these clubs and nobody was there. And then all of a sudden these places were just jam packed on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, et cetera. And then all of a sudden they get to like the late, you know, the later years. And by like 1989, they're playing, you know, there's still bands in these places, but the, the bigger bands are playing arenas. And then all of a sudden Nirvana comes and nobody's at these clubs anymore. And it's just how it happened overnight. It is a fascinating look. And just listening to some of these um, musicians tell their stories of like overindulgence and, you know, you know, all the excesses in life. And then to have it be gone in the blink of an eye, it is a fascinating read. I, I strongly encourage you to take a, you know, take a look at it. Yeah. It was like overnight, everybody traded in their, uh, their their battle jackets for uh, flannel shirts. And That's right. Jeans. That's right. It, it was. I mean, and like so. Then some of these bands start adapting to that sound, but they just, you know, they were they were older at this point. And then at this point, they're in their thirties, late thirties, and then you got a bunch of grunge rockers that are twenty three years old coming out of Seattle, and they were just blown off the map. And like they used to, they used to be like all these issues regarding like putting up your posters on the Sunset Strip and making sure that you got like the best sight lines to these posters so that people came to see your show and then by the by by 91 you couldn't even find the poster because nobody it was like empty it was really really interesting so i don't think why i think wasp probably had their posters up i don't think they gave a shit if they were on the radio (laughs) yeah i mean that again that's just the vibe that i got uh yeah no totally and then you get to love machine which is another one of their big hits um This one has a definite Motley Crue vibe to me. And I I think it's this like really interesting drumming. Very, very simple, but it kind of helps carry this song. And it makes me want to like drum on the steering wheel. It's one of those songs that like when I, when I hear it, I, you know, I kind of rock out to it or whatever. Um, A bit repetitive, but I can easily see why this and really the, the two prior songs are both kind of 
big hits. Like these, they, they start it strong, and then from there it, it it goes on in a little bit of a different direction. Yeah, this is kind of the beginning of um, Wasp. Uh, Wasp teaches you to spell. Um, <laughs> the first the first time I heard this song, I was you know working as as usual, and um, I had to like do a, a double take, and I was like. Are they singing LL Bean like LL Bean? <laughs> like I thought it was like I thought I, I was going to run out and get a pair of khakis and, and maybe a hoodie. Um, <laughs> then I realized that's not. But um, there were maybe a couple of things I misheard during my uh, my wasp experience. Um, but uh, this is I, I'm not going to be able to unhear it now, unfortunately. So now whenever I hear this song, I'm just going to think about you know khakis. If it's it's um don't you hate when that happens you mishear it and then you can't unhear it or you can't unsee it uh, I'm yeah. with you um any thoughts on the song itself or just um just just khakis and uh no the, honestly like it's it's interesting because th- th- this last week or two I, I've been rewatching the Karate Kid uh, movies because like I don't you know I, I know you're a fan of uh, of Cobra Kai uh, as am I um I feel like the the Cobra Kai series has really made the, the, the Karate Kid sequels feel so much more important. Like, I I feel like they kind of like, you know, passed out. The second one kind of got like mixed reviews. The third one was pretty much panned, but now that a lot of those characters have been, um, you know, brought back in Cobra Kai where you have like chosen and, um, Terry Silver, um, it, it's 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 so much fun to see them in their young forms, and the it, it breathes this whole new life into the, these old movies. Um, I, I remember always being a fan of Part Two, and always thinking that Part Three kind of sucked. But now I'm watching Part Three, and kind of like, man, you're seeing like this young, insane Terry Silver and uh, Mike Barnes, the the karate, the karate's bad boy, and I'm like. Boy, it, it because Cobra Kai is so good. It's almost like this prequel to Cobra Kai. It makes it better. And anyway, it just this song, uh, Love Machine. It, it feels like it comes right out of that era of the '80s. Like you know, this album came out the same year that um, the first Karate Kid movie came out. Anyway, so I've kind of just I feel like I've been trapped in the '80s the, with with both uh, you know movies and and music. Um, but this is like just a perfect song for the time period. I, I enjoyed this one. It's one of my one of my uh, more favorite um, tunes on the album. Definitely nice. You know, it's funny. I think that's a. I love that story. Just the Cobra Kai aside, I love how Chosen's character. And I, I don't know. W- this has nothing to do with Wasp, but you brought it up, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with it. I think Chosen's character more than anybody has puts a smile on my face because he was so. <laughs> Uh, so stoic and serious in that first in, in 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 the Karate Kid too, and in this one he's like a clown. Like forty years, forty years did him well because he mellow. I mean, he's still serious in certain ways, but in other ways he's kind of just like almost like a clown. I I, I don't know how to describe it. And like you, this poor guy comes over from Japan. I mean, spoilers. I t- skip the next thirty seconds if you if you haven't seen the show. But like he comes over from Japan just to help out. Like just to help fight silver who is in a movie that he was never, he, there was, they never crossed paths, but here he is in America helping um, Daniel son. It makes the, no the, sense. But the idea that the idea that, and again, spoilers, the idea that by, by where the series is up to that Daniel's three biggest rivals in the three movies are all on his side. By the end of the movie, he has Johnny Lawrence chosen to Gucci and Mike Barnes all fighting on his side and all three were complete assholes to him in those <laughs> movies. It's, it's, it's amazing. It, it's, and you could see the brilliance of, of the Terry silver character, even back then, it, except this is like this. I think they even made a joke to this effect on Cobra Kai that he, I think he made a joke that he was like coked up because the character is so over the top in the movie. I feel like they kind of use that as a excuse for the overacting but he's like he really does seem like that real like eighties cokehead like rich co- lunatic cokehead. He's brilliant as just this off the wall eighties bad guy, and and he's really carried that uh, that on to the to nowadays. I think he's been one of the MVPs of a show full of MVPs. Um, the the fact that they chose not to ignore the sequels and like I, I don't know if you even picked up on the whole thing where um, it's revealed that. Daniel was introduced to his wife by the girl that he met in Karate Kid 3, 
who happens to be his wife's like cousin or something. Yep, it's yep. like that, that attention to detail makes me a, f- a fan of something even more. I love stuff like that. So yeah, little, I, wish other shows did it. I wish other shows did it. Um, but we, we can, we can save this for the karate kid exchange, but we'll, 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 we'll go back. We'll go back to the metal exchange for a second, but I, I, I did like that little, uh, um, we'll have a, we'll have a special episode called Cobra Kai Hansen and we'll, we'll... <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. Um, <laughs> The, the, it's funny. The Flame is the first track that I'm hearing that I had no familiarity with. I had never heard this song before in my life. Um, this, for whatever reason, I didn't think the mix on this track was particularly good. And, and if people are kind of knocking the mix on the album, on this song, I happen to thoroughly agree. I don't think it's that good. Um, Blackie is a little bit too high in the mix. I thought it was a, the back end of it was a little muddy for my taste. Um, the chorus is so simple quite good. I didn't love the guitar solo. I don't think it's my favorite track by any means. I think it's kind of one of the mediocre tracks on the album. I know it, other people love this tune. It's It just misses the mark for me a little bit, but I don't hate it. I, I don't hate it. It's just a, a good song. It, it, I wouldn't call it great by any means. Yeah, you know, this one kind of does feel like had there been a radio hit, and maybe, I don't know, maybe there was. I'm not really sure. Uh, maybe you could speak to that, but um, this feels like it would have really fit like 80s rock radio really well. Um, I agree, it wasn't one of my favorites either, but it's still, still a pretty good song. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I, I don't know that there were really any songs that I didn't enjoy. This sure, was a really sure. kind of, this that whole thing was a very pleasant experience, I will say. I and- I, I listened, I, I really enjoyed this um, just because I like this kind of uh, this era. And, and so like, I, I can't wait to dig into, I have my friend Jay, um, you know, he's a, he's a, a few years older than me and he really grew up during this era. And like, you know, he would, he would always say to me like, dude, you know, who was great rat, like rat, like, like, you know, everybody knows round and round, but like, like, if you dig into their, their cat, like their full album or whatever is like, like, um, they, they have some really good songs. And then, um, I believe, uh, Mark, mentioned white lion uh in the metal exchanges facebook group and that's another band that i know yep. like three or four songs by but but would love to get deeper into so i know like when these kind of bands like you know when Dokken comes up and um i forgot who was the uh who was uh Te- was a tesla that that dale uh that dale um yeah, yeah. uh requested and the like, blue murder album that we yeah covered. Like, like there was a lot in this period but like i seem to enjoy it every time we do it yeah. for sure yeah, and there's so much of it that I just don't know. So, like, it's always uh, – but, like, I always know when I hear a certain name of a band, I'm like, yeah, this, this – I know this will be good. And even though I knew literally a cover of Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting and that was it, I was like, I bet you Wasp <laughs> is good, even with, like, Sight Unseen or, or whatever. Um, yeah, it's and – it, and it is, although for me – and I'll get into this a little bit more later – there's a nostalgia here because I did listen to some of these songs a lot, a lot, a lot 20 years ago. I don't know that I love them as much now. I think that I've kind of just moved on, although I enjoyed the experience for what it was. But I I'm, I mean, spoiler, the album's not going to be a 9.5 for me. Like, it's good, but I don't know that it's great. Um, but there's certain songs that definitely stand out. BAD or bad is not one of them. This is a, this is, we slow down a little bit here and it's got a very awesome like guitar intro. The drums come in behind it. What pops here for the first time though is the bass playing. I thought that, um, I thought the bass playing on this track was really, really good and the mix was just so much better than the flame. Um, it's a good track. It's not, again, I would say it's not a, a, a great track. Um, it, it's very cheesy and I think that one, if you, if you just take your mind out of that headspace, what I enjoyed it was like being at my desk, listening to this album and this track in particular, because it was just like a very easy listen for me. Yeah. And I mean, to be honest, like I kind of felt that way about really the whole album. Sure. Um, but yeah, this was, um, it just, it really is just like, it just fits the time period. Like it really, I just find like all these songs are like to, to sound like Michael Cole, like vintage 1984. Um, it just like, this is like so, the, the, you know, spelling out the word of all the words in the English dictionary that you need spelled out for you. You thought love was simple enough, but bad. Okay. Um, 
Like, thank you for spelling that. It's almost like it's one step up from them spelling cat or dog for you. Spelling, um, though, not their forte on school days because it's <laughs> D-A-Z-E. So maybe well, there is a reason. It's It could be a play on words. I mean, maybe he's at school, but he's really in a daze. Um, or mm. it could be the um, it could be the unofficial sequel to Metal Days by uh, Manowar, which came out two years before this, uh, <laughs> which was also spelled D-A-Z-E. Or... or um, maybe it's pronounced Daze, like Eric Daze, former center for the Chicago Blackhawks, D A Z E. That's that. Now you're onto something. I think yeah. it is. Daze. Well, I'm really I'm hitting all the deep cuts. Karate Kid Three, <laughs> Eric Daze. I hope Nops. I know Nops remembers Eric Daze. So shout out to Nops. <laughs> um, s- I promise days. I have not been drinking tonight. Just... That that's that that uh, is. Are you taking medication for your illness? Is it, can we blame it on Benadryl or no? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's Tussin. I'm, I'm oh. <laughs> wasted on Tussin right now. <laughs> uh, School Days is the last of the four singles on this album. You had talked about like radio play. I have no idea if this stuff was on the radio, but what I can tell you is Love Machine is the first single. I Want to Be Somebody is the second single. Sleeping in the Fire I thought was a really interesting choice for their third single, and then School Days as their fourth and final single from this album. Um, this has the silliest intro with the Pledge of Allegiance and the school kids. And I'm like, what the fuck? What is this? And it really has that glammy, motley crew vibe going on, probably more than any other track on the album. But I'll tell this. There's a couple of things here that I really liked. At one point, they he starts riding the the cymbal, and it almost sounds like a cowbell. I thought it was like just this nice little touch that he had in, in, for the, in the drum parts. And I thought when the in, during the chorus when he's like, I pledge no allegiance – I thought that was a nice contrast to the beginning. Um, what I what I realized more than anything, though, on this track is the a lot of these songs are so simple, like so simple and so, um, you know, a band that has not yet evolved to some serious songwriting. And I say that because when I think of a, a song like The Idol that they played live um, on this tour – from the Crimson Idol, that is almost a progressive metal song. And it reminds me a lot of like something you would hear on Queens Rikers, Operation Mind Crime. But this album, this first Wasp album is the antithesis of that. It's so simple. It's like, you know, like paint by numbers, intro to metal 101, but it's, it, it's endearing in its own way. I don't know if there's a music video for this song, but this feels like one of those songs that would have been a perfect MTV video with like, the kid, the kid in the the denim jacket with all the metal patches on it, falling asleep in the classroom, and then like wasp bursts through the blackboard, and you know, like, and and meanwhile on the blackboard it shows the spelling of love and bad. Um, I, I just, <laughs> I mean, where was I? I could have, I could have uh, directed this. Uh, uh, you know, I, I could have been the 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 first coming of Spike Jones. Um, <laughs> hey, that's just, uh, I don't know. That's how I see it. Um, I don't know. The song reminded me of Mike, uh, just kind of like one of those, like, I want to be in school. Yeah. Like, like one of those ironic songs about school, uh, from the eighties. Like just, I just, I, I could just picture like, I don't know. I picture Mike liking the song. So. I completely, completely hear you. Um, I, I will say that of all the songs that I hadn't heard Helion or Helion, the next one is probably my favorite. This song, I, and I, maybe it's me. They were like elements of power metal on this song. Like it kind of reminded me of like an early, early power metal song. Really heavy, catchy, fast, great riff. Love the backing vocals, an amazing solo. This one is the one that grew on me. And for whatever reason, when I had my ear pods in during my commute, this song really popped for some reason, and I thought this was fantastic. The only knock, slightly repetitive, and but as many of these songs are, but this was almost my song of the week. I love this track. I thought it was great. Yeah, good tune. I, I was, um, I, I'm seeing here too that Children of Bodom and In uh, Eternum both covered it. Um, which I got to hear that. Imagine those are both very different versions, uh, but um, yeah, and it looks like there's a bunch of other songs from this album that have been covered as well but um good 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 tune um i I was also happy to not hear any spelling at this point (laughs) um yeah definitely good definitely good tune. and and the other thing too like all these songs with the exception of of tormentor are under four minutes they're all just like in and out 
you know, they don't uh, overstay their welcome. Um, just, uh, just, just like a really like, like you said, like it, it's 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 simple, but it, it's enjoyable. And I think that that's, I think part of the reason why it was really easy to play this over and over again because I don't think it was, you know, I wasn't having to concentrate on each time change or each change of key signature or anything. It was just in, you're out, and then you're on to the next one. And to their credit, every one of these songs sounds very different. Like. They're simple songs, but they sound. I don't think I, I. I. I found each song very, very separate and distinct from the predecessor and from the next track, which is a compliment because sometimes we can listen to stuff and it just sounds very samey in many ways. This didn't have that problem, at least for me. No, not for me either. And, and that it's a good way to segue into the next track, uh, "Sleeping in the Fire," because I mean. Th- when that, when that acoustic guitar came in, I thought I, I thought I accidentally put on something else. I thought um, "Carry On" by Manowar was about to start, <laughs> but it really is that kind of like vintage '80s um, like acoustic guitar intro um, where you're Into not to the power ballad. Yeah, you're not quite sure if it's going to like be a full on power ballad or it's just going to start out mellow and then just like like Manowar's "Carry On," like it just kind of blows up. Um, but this is a this is a good tune. Um, definitely another candidate for uh some over dramatic 80s mtv music video um with like some girl with um like a blowout hair and like uh acid wash jeans um you know breaking some guy's heart who like definitely is not nearly uh good enough looking to be anywhere near her um uh, some of these these video tropes might sound familiar to those watching videos in the 80s but uh it, it was good um it, I got a li- at certain points on this album, I got kind of a vibe of, of from like a Pretty Maid's very first album, mm. uh, Red Hot and Heavy, um, because I think that before, you know, they before they would release Future World, which we talked about, um, they kind of had more of a more of a straight up hard rock kind of vibe. But before I think they started to pick up more. Um, like heavy metal and power metal kind of elements. And so uh, I got a little bit of, in this song, uh, especially um, just kind of the way that it was structured and the, the way the guitars sound and stuff, um, just a little something that I kind of picked up, not really anything that pretty maids did beyond that first album, but there was kind of this like rawness to that very first album, which I, uh, believe was released the same year as this yeah. one in 1984. Um, so uh, I, I have a feeling that there were probably just a lot of bands that were experimenting with that type of sound around that time. So um, I'm sure that's not a, uh, a coincidence, but um, yeah, it's good, good kind of, uh, you know, power ballad, you know, a kind of a, a emotional kind of tune. Um, if, if I'm remembering the album correctly, I think this is the only one, right? It it is, and in my opinion, it's it was almost ahead of its time. I feel like if this album, if this song had come out in 1988, it would have been all over the radio. But I don't know that they were playing the power ballad, like the metal power ballads, in 1984. So it kind of missed the mark. But to me, this was the this was the song that should have been the radio hit. I think it's probably the most palatable. It's not as sleazy as some of the others, and it has like that Dokken esque songwriting quality to it. I, although I do think Pretty Maid is a very good example for that early Pretty Maid sound, but I, I, I hear docking on this. Um, and then it's like the complete antithesis of On Your Knees, right? On Your Knees is is Steel Panther before Steel Panther. It is right. a sleazy, hard rocking tune, amazing verses, a chorus that's kind of boring and, and repetitive for sure, but that there's this bridge that's by far the best bridge on the album and Blackie sounds fantastic. It's it's such an eighties chorus, like where like it's like the uh everybody's like it's almost like an anthem kind of vibe. Yep. Um yep. you know, it's yeah, it's like not it's not like super catchy or anything, but it's just kinda like, you know, it's just like very it's just very eighties. As as is Tormentor, which is the next track, in my opinion. Like the guitar tone and the drum patterns just very timely. This is what you were hearing on the Sunset Strip in 84. And like, it's it's kind of paint by numbers, but I enjoyed it. It's just a little slow, but it has this chunky riff that I, that I really, really enjoyed. And I like how it kind of picks up speed 
a lot of these tracks stay in one lane and they stay there for kind of the whole duration of the tune. This one kind of picks up speed as it gets to that instrumental section. And then at the outro, it completely goes off the rails with this like crazy guitar tone. This is an underrated track. And like, I think a track that nobody really talks about, but I enjoyed it. Well, I think that fans of the movies, the dungeon master and terror vision, probably remember this song pretty well. And uh, I'm only saying that because I'm reading it directly off of Wikipedia. But um, these were uh, two, two, two films that I believe were um, both both involved um, film director Ted Nicolau. Uh, I might be butchering that pronunciation. So uh, he must have been a big Wasp fan because he uh, they seem to have used this song in both of those films in 1984 and 1986 respectively um, i'll take it one step further do you know why wasp is in the movie oh well then there you go that that makes a lot of sense i have never seen it but from what i understand wasp is actually in the movie and so i think that that has something to do with it so i think that that's kind of why they used uh they used this stuff well that's awesome well yeah that's 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 a great little nugget of information very cool yeah I, um, something you learn something new every day yeah, what, this do, is what, do, this is what this is my second favorite uh, song with the word tormentor in it. Uh, uh, Steel after being number Steel one. Steel tormentor. Yeah. I, ha- I had I had a I had a feeling, but you're, it's in good company, so I'll, I'll give them that. Um, did you did you like it or just uh, did it kind of miss the mark for you? No, it was good. Um, I I think it was just kind of like you said, like every song kind of has its own flavor, and none of them are really bad. Um, not even bad. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah, I. I, I I don't know that there was really any one track that really stood out to me. Like I just thought everything was very, very solid. Um, and and I, I made a, a, an interesting choice for my song of the week, which you'll understand when we, we get to it. Um, just because I kind of had a hard time finding something that really stood out. So Well, uh, it's funny you mention that because here we are to the last song on the album proper, The Torture That Never Stops. It's not my track of the week, which is now we're getting into really interesting territory because we've (laughs) gone through the whole album and none of us have picked a song. But this is a very good closing track. Um, I I can't really imagine any other song in this closing spot. It's like a mid-paced rocker. Um, it's, It's got a rawness to the sound and it's very underrated. And I don't know if you hear this, but I definitely hear like a Sirens by Sabotage on this track. And I thought it was awesome because... Um, the, the la- and it also like kind of picks up speed for like the last 30 seconds. This is a good track and it's well constructed, but I definitely hear that early sabotage sound it. So I was a sucker for it right away. Yeah. I like, I like it too. I, I like that. Um, I thought that this, and I want to be somebody or two of the better songs on the album. And I like that they kind of bookended the, the original 10 track, uh, you know, album. Um, but I, I definitely, uh, echo, uh, everything you said um just really just i agree like there is kind of a bit of a early sabotage vibe in in the guitar in the guitar work here um but uh this is good stuff like just um really just a, a sign of the times but um in in all the, in all the right ways in all the good ways i am with you and that that kind of concludes the album proper a few words about some of these bonus tracks the first one is show no mercy and we talked about Cobra Kai earlier. This should have been the theme song to Cobra Kai. This song is phenomenal. Phenomenal. It is dirty. It's sleazy. It's angry. It's fast. I love everything about this song. It's It's got this really catchy groove. It's a headbanger. For the first time in Metal Exchange history, my song of the week is a bonus track because I, I love this song. Well, obviously, uh, my song of the week is also going to be uh, a bonus track, but uh, it's not this. Um, Interesting. Which kind of it doesn't really leave us with much else at this point. Um, well, but before we get before we get to yours, which I think is a very interesting choice, what did you think of Show No Mercy? I have to think that you like this, and it should have been on the TV show. Yeah, um, I like this a lot. I kind of I listened to this in pairing with um, with Animal because. Uh, it was the it was the B side to the Animals A side when um that when they was when it was released as a single it's a hell of a um, single I'm sorry it's a hell of a single when you have both of those tracks as the, yeah. as the actual release that's awesome yeah absolutely so um yeah this uh, again I think would have fit right on 
the the main album. I don't think it would have felt out of place at all. Um, but uh, yeah, it definitely would have fit on Cobra Kai. I, I, I I'm kind of surprised at how much um, Karate Kid slash Cobra Kai has been discussed in this episode. But I guess when you talk about an album from 1984, that's uh, bound to happen so with a um, song called show no mercy yeah uh, it's, there's there is no mercy in this dojo um <laughs> so what you know with that said why don't we uh why don't we give it a listen and uh and then we'll we'll carry on show no mercy justin's song of the week So again, in what can only be described as a first for the metal exchange, my song of the week is a bonus track, and so is yours. And it also, I guess, happens to be the cover of Painted Black, the Rolling Stones classic, one of my favorite rock songs from the 60s. Why is this your song of the week? This is, first of all, like just an all-time great song in and of itself by the Rolling Stones. But um, No question. When I when I was in college, uh, especially I want to say really early on freshman year, maybe sophomore year, um, me and Nops had a, a, had a, a mutual love for covers of Painted Black, and uh, off the top of my head, the two of the bands that we would listen to uh, that covered Painted Black were Gob, the uh, punk rock band, who um, if you're familiar with the the NHL video game soundtracks of the uh, 2002, 2003, 2004 era, they, they would, uh, they would pop up on there. And, uh, the Tea Party, who was, um, a band that, that Knops, uh, introduced me to when I first met him, he was like, it was half of what he ever wanted to talk about was that band. He was so, so into them. And, and I did, I actually did mention to him that he should, uh, he should send in a request for a, a Tea Party album. So maybe that might be something to look forward to in, uh, 2023. Um, so it was just awesome to hear another band, um, take another stab at this song. And, and this, this song just really, um, translates well to a hard rock or heavy metal version. Um, it's, you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty gritty song for like an old sixties classic rock tune. So, um, I, I thought, uh, you know, being that the only Wasp song I knew before this week was a cover of uh, Elton John, um, <laughs> why not have uh, another cover of a uh, British, um, you know, a British uh, standard bearer uh, be uh, my song of the week? So uh, um, I guess before we hear your thoughts on the cover, uh, we'll give uh, the Paint It Black uh, cover a-, a listen. Here it is. You know, it's funny. I absolutely adore 
absolutely adore their Saturday night's All Right for Fighting cover. For some reason, though, this cover, I don't I, – I love the original, but this, I, for some reason, this cover doesn't grab me. And I like that they put their own twist on it. It's just not my favorite cover. But, but I want to be clear. Wasp has done a ton of different covers, and I think that that's part of the reason why I, I – hold it to kind of a higher standard. I'm going to just name a few of them, but they've done um, Somebody to Love, Promised Land, Mississippi Queen, Locomotive Breath, Easy Living, the Uriah Heap cover. Uh, They've done a lot of covers and they do a really good job, but this one is just not my favorite of the bunch. But as a fan of the song, I can understand why you like this interpretation, if that makes sense. Um, So a, a good choice. Let me ask you this. On a scale of one to 10, What are you giving this and what do you think you would have given it going into just like going into the week, knowing just the Elton John cover? I think that I would, I would have expected to give it a 7.0 and I'm giving it a 7.0. It's pretty much exactly what I was expecting. And I think it's like I mentioned before, it's kind of like when I see a name like that, I just, you know, the same way, like if I saw, Rat or White Lion or, you know, any number of those bands can come, come across the way. I'd be like, oh, this is going to be a seven at, at, at worst, probably. Um, yeah. And I just thought this was really solid. Nothing really blew my socks off, but also there really wasn't anything even, even like approaching bad. Like, uh, well, except I, for I, the song. I, yeah, I keep uh, I keep making that inadvertent terrible joke, um, but <laughs> it, it's it's uh, it, it was just very good. Um, I I don't feel like I could I don't feel like I could give it any higher or lower than that. I'm with you. I'm a seven as well. I think that if you would have asked me 20 years ago, I probably would have given it a 7.5. I'm I'm a little sour on them or whatever. Um, but I want to talk more about the concert. Right, Armored Saint takes the stage, and just my luck. John Bush, who I am an absolute fanboy of, especially live, can't sing because he it was he had some vocal injury or, or issue. So he had missed like the two or three prior shows and they had the singer from Dangerous Toys sing for them. And he was actually great. I thought that Armored Saint was phenomenal. And then with two songs left in their set, John Bush strolls out onto the stage and says, we're going to give this a go. And he winds up singing the last two songs of the set. So I did get my eight minutes of John Bush on stage. Which and he, which two songs? It was a Can You Deliver and um, what was the other one? He, it was the last two songs of the set. It was Can You Deliver last and it home. was Madhouse. Oh. And, he, and it was great. And it, he did a really good job. And I thought it was fan, fantastic. Armored Saint was every bit as good as they usually are, even with the other singer. They were just, a, they're just a solid live band. Now I'm going to talk about Wasp for a second. I, again, I have no idea what people are saying, and I thought that the Wasp show was really good, but I have one major, major complaint, and it's either either Blackie Lawless is the greatest singer in the history of metal, <laughs> or something was awry here, because it sounded, the, 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 the Wasp sound, and Blackie Lawless's vocals, for a man who is in his 60s, he has not missed a beat. The man sounded like he was singing in 1984, and there, there, there had to be something going on with the with like the backing trackings and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that he can't sing live. It was too good. It was, it was, it was beyond good. It was perfection. And I think that there may have been some foul play as a result because this, the, the, it was a good set. It was an energetic set. And they had their music videos on in the background on screens behind them as they were playing. It was a really cool vibe. I just couldn't get over how perfect it sounded and it kind of took me away from it. I almost, for a band that should sound raw and sleazy, it was too well produced, if that makes sense. Is that similar to what other people are saying? Because those are my thoughts. Um, I mean, I thought that you put that in a way nicer way than some of the things I've been reading, which were this whole like it, he was full of shit and like all of his vocals were pre-recorded and yeah. there were a couple of moments where he grabbed the microphone to kind of make it seem like he was really singing but 90 percent of it and and you know who's to say maybe he's is that something's up with his throat and he didn't want to bow out and that was because uh, i think i had heard 
uh, someone else say that they had seen Wasp live not that long ago, like a few years ago, and he was clearly singing live and he sounded awesome. So it's possible that he's battling something or something's going on and they, he needed a little assistance. But um, uh, there were a few people that were not happy about that and they thought that it was... Um, they thought that it was kind of um, shitty for the band to kind of like charge money to, for people to come and listen to something that was pre-recorded. And uh, I think I had read somewhere a bunch of people were calling out Eddie Trunk for not saying anything about it because Eddie Trunk apparently made a fuss about it, about, some, uh, about I don't know if he was talking about anyone specifically, but he had mentioned that it, it, he didn't like it when that was done. And now for like Wasps to come out and now get called out on it and for him to stay quiet about it kind of, I guess, makes him look Double like standard. A, a hypocrite. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, to me, I don't take that kind of stuff too, too seriously. Like if it was, um, I guess if I was a really big fan of the band, I would, it would be disappointing. If it was like, if I, it was just me me myself going to a wasp concert just for a good time, have a few beers and like, I would just be kind of more into it for the experience and hearing the live guitars and bass and drums and the vocals wouldn't be that important to me as long as it, you know, it all, the whole presentation looked and sounded well, acceptable. But I mean, on the other hand, like if I went to a Halloween show and, and Kisk's vocals were pre-recorded, I probably would be pretty disappointed. So and, and I get point, why a die, I get why a diehard fan would be, would be like, you know, kind of disappointed that that was the, you know, choice that they made. His mic stand was huge and like almost blocked him so that you couldn't see him. And as soon as it came out, I said, something is not right here because it was like almost like he didn't want to be seen and it was kind of hiding behind it. Maybe it was just me. Um, and again, I could be wrong, right? Maybe he's just phenomenal live, but it just, it didn't add up to me. I'll say that. One interesting thing though is you have any idea who was playing drums for, for him? Uh, no, it, not, not at the moment, no. Achilles Priester from Angle, Oh, I did know that. I, yeah, because cool. I remember like thinking to myself – it's so funny kind of seeing these um some of these names that pop up now when you see that like Kiko Lorero is in Megadeth and uh Michelle Lupi is in um White Snake White Snake like yeah. it, it's these names that we know from these like you know little known metal bands and now they're like you know playing in in these bigger you know with these bigger names and stuff um that, I I thought that was kind of funny um but I have always heard that he's kind of a a monster on the drums. Wasn't he like a supposedly a finalist for the dream theater job when um, he was in that documentary they did, he right? Was. It, I'll tell you something. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal drummer. He's, he's great. But one of the most interesting things I've ever seen was that documentary where he's trying to play the dream theater stuff and he fucks up and he completely <laughs> screws up. Right. And you're watching one of the best drummers in the world and he can't, he can't get through whatever song it was. I forget. And like you, you realize at that point the greatness that is a Mike Mangini or a Mike Portnoy because here is one of the most accomplished drummers in the world, and he, he just flat out screwed it up and kind of messed up the audition. If you've never seen it, it is well worth an hour of your time to go watch this thing. It is incredible. In fact, I'm going to go watch it again just because I, I, I was talking, joking with my friend about it that night, where the, the Wasp stuff is so easy and so like. You can do it in his sleep, but just don't ask him to play Dance of Eternity because he's not. He can't yeah. get through it. Well, there's a reason why, like you know, Rush just ended when you know Neil Peart <laughs> fell ill because it's like just some guys are just can't be replicated. And and I mean, Neil Peart is, is arguably the greatest to ever do it. So like you know, what's Rush without that guy on the playing drums? I mean, maybe maybe you'd argue there is no Rush. Uh, I think a lot of people would argue that. So. um you know, uh, on on a similar level, it's going to be interesting to see what the Foo Fighters do without Taylor Hawkins, uh, you know, on the kit um, after he was such a staple with that band and his closeness with the rest of the band, especially Dave Grohl, um, who no slouch behind the drums uh, either. Um, but I don't think he has any interest in going back to doing that full time. So I'm curious to see if the Foo Fighters um, remain an entity. I would be disappointing if they don't because selfishly i've still have yet to see them play live and it's something that 
um, I really would like to do. Uh, it sucks that I'll never get to see Taylor play, but um, it, it's funny because I just feel like some drummers don't always get their due. So it's 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 I think it's nice to kind of bring them up every now and again. Um, I'm with you, and like I said, Achilles did a great job. Uh, just a couple of quick news items before we before we run out. Riverside has announced their North American tour dates for next year, starting in Tampa Bay on February 17th, going for about a month, ending in Carborough, North Carolina, a, a city that I can't say I've ever been to on March 21st. Um, they are playing New York City, which was of particular interest to me, on March 16th, Stone Cold Day. So I'm looking forward to uh, <laughs> catching them. I haven't seen them in a long time. So always always a pleasure to see Riverside. And their opening band is the Siberium, who we saw at Prog Power this year, which yes. I thought was interesting. And then Elevati, another band who I've never seen live, have announced their 2023 tour dates. And I don't know if you heard about this. That's, that tour kicks off in Baltimore, Maryland on March 2nd. It ends April 1st in Richmond, Virginia. And joining them is Omnium Gatherum and Seven Spires. That is a really cool show. Yeah, that's a that's a great lineup. Um, and good for Seven Spires. I think that's an, another I think another tour where they're going to get some some uh, uh, eyeballs uh, on them. Yeah, uh, you know that that I that I think that they're going. Nowhere but up. Um, they are going to do a headlining tour before you know it. I, yeah, but like for sure. a real headlining tour. Yeah, um, I've I've not seen El Wadey live before. I would I would I think that would be really cool uh, to to see. Um, and I'm not really that. Uh, I'm not really super familiar with Om- Omnium Gatherum. I, I should probably. I think you'd like them. They're, yeah. they're it's 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 melodic death metal, but there's a poppiness to them that I think you would enjoy. Like they 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 do a great job, and I have seen them live. Um, and obviously I've seen Spires live multiple times, but I'm going to make a point of trying to get to this show on March the 3rd when they, when they play in New York city, I, I feel like that would be a really fun show to go to. And it happens to be on a Friday. So I'm going to do make, make my best efforts to get to that after work on, on that. Well, day. that's, is that only a week after the, uh, power wolf show or two weeks after two weeks? Yeah. Uh, it, that's the thing. Like for me, like getting down, I, I definitely, like, I have guaranteed penciled in going, like, no, sorry, penned in, not penciled in, penned in, uh, Power Wolf in, in February and Halloween in May. Um, it's a and tough one. It, it's funny. It feels like these tours are getting announced, like, like in this furious way. And it's kind of like, no, nope, this is just how it was before the pandemic made us, re- like, forget what reality was like and that bands just announced tours uh, and a lot of them happen and a lot of them happen near each other and it's uh i think it's just a reminder that we're kind of headed back to normal again and that's a really good thing um so it's it's great to it's great to feel like you can you can almost like pick and choose which shows you can go to and you could say hey maybe i don't need to go to this one because i'm going to one two weeks before that or the week after that or whatever so i mean vola played here last night to a sold out crowd i didn't go and it's not because i'm not a fan of the band i love vola but i'm gonna see him next year at prog power i had basketball tickets so it didn't work out for me but um I heard it was a great show. I've heard they are phenomenal live. And I'm not talking about Soen, who I actually am seeing next week. <laughs> so Yeah, and I saw that Earthside open, which um is definitely a a band I think that fits that 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 Vola fan base really well. Um I, I know uh, our mutual friend uh Ralph was there and I think um Milton was there as well and it sounds like uh everything I heard was all, was very positive. So um For sure. Yeah, I I I have to really uh, bone up on my Vola uh knowledge uh, going into Prog Power. And I'm actually I'm kind of glad you mentioned Prog Power cuz I wanted to bring up uh the day 1 uh Wednesday night lineup has finally been announced. I guess there was a a snafu uh with one of the bands and they were caused a delay in the announcement. Um I, I, jokingly Nathan posted after centuries of waiting, um, which I, I, I don't know if it felt like it was that long, but, uh, you know, it, it was significantly after Milton had announced the Thursday night lineup. So um, I'm going to name each band and uh, you can give me a few thoughts uh, on them. So we start out with uh, the opening band is going to be, um, I believe you had told me that they are from, are they from New York, uh, Ice Age? Yeah, they're, they're a Long Island band. They're called Ice Age. They were, I think, on Magna Carta back on the day with all those other bands that we've 
you know, talked about with like Magellan and Shadow Gallery and all that stuff. Um, I like them, although I am not terribly familiar with what I've heard. I need to go back and listen to those albums as well. But an interesting opener. I like to, I'll probably catch a flight down with them. I mean, it, it, it should be interesting to say the least. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip the band number two for the end because I have a few extended thoughts that I've, for whatever reason, um, just had a complete mind mind fart and and uh brain fart and forgot to mention but uh so we'll skip band number two band number three is um wow i probably should have uh remembered um cynic. oh uh cynic yes yeah, cynic is gonna play their focus um, album yes which um is uh it will be the 30th 30 year anniversary um they also were just announced to be playing that same set on the uh 70, tons of metal uh festival this um uh early next year um thoughts on this i'm not familiar with this album i have listened to this album i think about 10 times and i can't get into it and it's actually an album we probably should cover because i i I need to give it another listen and i need to do it day after day where i can kind of immerse myself in it our mutual friend Tyler basically told me you have to go see this band on the cruise because he he said that like they are that good live. I don't I don't hear it. I I for some I, I mean I'm a prog guy and I can't get into this band so I must be missing something. An interesting choice. I think it's a worthy spot for the band. It just falls on deaf ears with me. Yeah. Um. Like we did uh, earlier this year. Um. I think that we'll probably dig into some more prog power bands. Um, I mean, I hate to say it, but you just never know who the hell is going to end up sticking onto the lineup by the time it gets closer to the festival with all of the issues we've had with visas and and all that over the years. They're an American band. So there's a very good chance they do. Yeah, I guess, I guess there's not too much harm in in that. Um, But yeah, I I definitely, when there's a band playing an entire album, I think that it, it behooves us to to talk about it. Um, the the second to last band, uh, Swallow the Sun, um, uh, from Finland, I believe they are. It's doomy death metal from Finland. An interesting choice for Nathan. I don't really think this is in his wheelhouse per se. It's kind of the antithesis of what he usually books. I'm a fan of the band. I've seen them live. They put on a phenomenal show. And to me, it's one of the highlights. It, it's them and band number two for me, for, for my money. I, I'm looking forward to both of those sets. Yeah, um, another band that I am not super familiar with, so I'd like to give them more of a a listen. Do they have a lot of albums? I feel like they've been around for a decent they have, while. They have. But I mean, yeah. even if you just started with the new one, it would be a good place. To, one of the last two albums, I think, would be a good place to start for a new Yeah, you know, I have a, band. I have a couple of tracks from their... Uh, their Moonflowers album that I probably got on your recommendation. Um, so that, yeah, that, that's another band I'm going to have to uh, give a listen to. And then, and then headlining, um, uh, there'll be her uh, second time at Prague Power, uh, Doro, um, you know, just the, uh, just the classic, you know, that classic heavy metal sound from the eighties. And, and uh, she's, um, She's a hell of a, a live performer. I I thought she really kicked ass um, when the last time she came to Prague Power, and I thought it was super cool when she uh, came out with Angra and did um, a song with them. So uh, that kind of rounds out the uh, the lineup. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts on on that, or just it is what it is? I I, I appreciate her and her legacy, and I think that she is very good live. Just not. I I would I would have booked somebody else if it was me. But again, that's just easy for me to say, right? I don't I don't have any you know skin in the game. Um, if I'm there, I'll probably watch some of the set. I, I just don't. I don't know. It's, I don't have really strong. I I, I wasn't familiar with any of her songs either solo or warlock. Um, and then going into the uh, her last appearance of Prog Power, I found out that. There's some really good stuff um, uh, in that catalog of songs that, and I ended up I ended up enjoying it a lot more than I thought, and and uh, so 
it's 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 cool. It's a cool choice. Um, I, I think it's going to be interesting. And so, kind of backtracking. So the band number two, uh, you know, um, they had the uh, distinction of being the focus of our 100th episode, and that that being Power Quest, and, and what makes that interesting beyond the fact that I'm completely obsessed with them is that um, this is being billed as their final festival appearance um, before they uh, the band retire. Well, the band is retiring. Uh, the band members, I can't speak for all of them. I don't know what anybody else's future plans are. I, I just think that Steve Williams is personally uh, retiring the band um, and, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of thoughts for me. It's, um, it's a lot of excitement. Um, I have been really clamoring. I, there, there was a time in my life where I never thought I would see this band play in the United States. And now, um, we're kind of reaching the point where we're going to see them twice. Um, they were supposed to play, uh, at Prague Power this year. Uh, on the initial lineup and, and I think the pandemic kind of um, poo pooed that uh, possibility, but um, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be emotional. Um, it's, I, I'm kind of glad that we have um, some time to kind of process the news and then kind of go into it. And I think it'll be, good i think it'll be closure uh and i think it, if if they only play for 60 minutes i think it's going to be <laughs> one of the fastest hours of my life um but uh i'm really glad that uh i know that a number of the members of the band uh ash in particular were really excited about coming back to the states again um and i think that they had such a positive experience the last time they played at prog power that i think it's really great that they'll you know, they'll they'll use that center stage stage for their final uh, festival show. And I, I imagine there will be a um, a final final show, probably closer to, to home for them. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I I know where I'll be uh, for that. <laughs> I can only imagine what that must be like for you. I'm looking forward to that set. They were so good last time. I expect them to be nothing short of brilliant this time around. And hopefully they'll have the their full band in tow this time. Um, yeah. Because the last time, uh, you know, their two guitar players, um, because they were new to the band, just didn't have uh, work visas. So thankfully, uh, you know, Chris Peterson and um, – uh, Bill Hudson. Bill Hudson to the rescue, yeah. uh, who will be there with Doro's band. He, he plays guitar oh, with Doro, yeah, so that's right. I would imagine we'll be seeing him uh, on stage with Power Quest at some point uh, as kind of a an honorary member, if not a, a briefly uh, a briefly uh, official member of the band. Um, I do wonder if the band will have uh, some other uh, treats in store for us. Um, it would be kind of cool to see some other special guests, but. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited for that, and, and um, it's pretty much uh, it's pretty much the the band I'm most looking forward to seeing now that we have that entire four day lineup uh, officially announced. So um, it, it's uh, there's a lot there's a lot to look forward to across those four days. I, I'd forgotten about a number of bands that were playing, especially on Friday and Saturday, and there's bands that like. I still have yet to really dig into like Cryptex and, and uh, Orbit Culture and um, j- there's just, oh my God, I, I think it's going to be a really, uh, it's going to be a lot of, a lot of actually seeing bands this time. Whereas I was really um, kind of subdued in that sense this, this past year, because it was kind of like, you know, dipping your toe back in the water, so to speak. And so uh, I think next year I'm going to be ready to just like, See some, see some friggin' bands. Let's do it. I, li- I like it, and it's a birthday treat for me again. So I'm selfishly looking forward to it immensely. Um, because this came out on Thanksgiving, and because on Monday we are going to release another episode for the f- first time. Really, I think we've kind of you, you told me offline what we're going to listen to. Normally, it's a surprise, but why don't you share with uh, everyone where our album is for next week? Yeah, well, you know, being that. 
we're going to be recording these episodes pretty much about three or four days apart. Uh, I went with something that I think was, uh, again, another kind of, uh, you know, uh, softball, so to speak, but um, an album that I know both of us are, are very big fans of. And um, again, I'm going to choose a band that we've talked about already, um, but a very different album uh, compared to the first one. And that's uh, Nightwish's Imaginarum album. Um, we talked about Oceanborn, which was their uh, second release. Um, and, and um, you know, that was when uh, Tarya Tarunin was their lead vocalist. And now, you know, this would be the second album that they did with uh, Annette. Um, why am I forgetting Annette's last name? That's so weird. Uh, Annette Olsen. Annette Olsen. Um, this, this, I love talking about this band because its opinions are so uh, varied. Uh, as to, There's people who love... Um, absolutely love this album and Dark Passion Play, which were the two albums that uh, that Annette were on. There are people that are just like, Taria or Die, like Taria's my ride or die, forget it. And then, um, and now we have, uh, we have two albums now with Floor, um, which, uh, you know, we talked a bit about um, human nature on our year-end uh, episode last, last year. Um, I happen to be a big fan of... Um, uh, Endless Form is Most Beautiful. I know there's some people that might not agree with that. Um, I thought that album was phenomenal. Uh, but this album, I think, marked a really interesting point in the band. It's almost kind of where the old version of Nightwish kind of turned over and they kind of became what I think the band is now is more of this kind of vibe. Uh, even though Annette sings on this and the previous album, I think that there's a big, there's a very big difference between Dark Passion Play and this. And we're, I know no better person to talk to than you about, about this. So um, I have I, such I'm strong looking thoughts, forward to this. I'm, I will obviously wait on those, but for all intents and purposes, you couldn't pick an album that's more different than Ocean Born, which is what we talked about last time. And so it's almost like talking about them for the first time because it's just so different. And if you played something off of Ocean Born, you played something off of this to the to the casual listener, they would say, well, obviously it's two different bands because they just sound nothing alike. Um, so it'll be an interesting choice. And then we have our uh, album set aside for the beginning of December – which is a request that we are finally getting around to. So we'll, we'll announce that on, uh, on our next episode as well. Yes. So, uh, Enjoy. yeah. Um, again, like I said, yeah. like just finding the next album to pick, it's like, you know, do I want to try to pick a band that we haven't done yet? Or there's so many bands we've talked about that obviously deserve a revisit and, and Gamma Ray and not, you know, Gamma Ray last week and Nightwish next week, I think are both, kind of bands in that discussion um so i don't know i i've kind of gotten to the point where i'm just kind of winging it each each time it's my my choice there's just there's plenty to choose from so i feel like you can't really go wrong no shortage of uh, options to say the least but enjoy the week bud i look forward to uh catching up with you soon and talking about some night wish and uh keep the request coming love the engagement on social media and we will see everybody real soon take it easy yeah, bud um, and enjoy the thanksgiving yeah, happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and uh, we'll see you in a few days. <laughs> Take it easy, bud.